Okay, so, so in this video, we're going to take a look at thermal expansion or the change in size of an object when we heat it. To put this in the context of the previous video, we looked at what was happening in terms of energy when temperature is changed and when the state of a material has changed. So what we said was when temperature is changed, that means the kinetic energy of particles was changing. And if the state changes, that means it's the potential energy of the particles that's changing. And it's a very effective model to explain the graph that we had earlier. However, you may well already know that when materials are heated, they expand, which means the atom separation must be increasing. That's how we expand something. So in the context of what we talked about last time, that in theory should then mean the potential energy increases. So our expression for conservation of energy would be wrong. So given that's the case, why did we not have potential energy when we were thinking about calculating our temperature change? Why did we assume all the energy would become kinetic energy? So that's the question we're going to be thinking about today. So in order to be able to answer this question, we need to do a few things. So what we're going to look at first is how the structure of a material changes when you heat it. We're going to look at some of the limitations using Q equals mc delta t, reflecting on what we've just talked about. Then we're going to look at how we can actually make thermal expansion a useful process. So we'll look at how we can use it to make switches and how we can use it to make thermometers as well. OK, so first of all, what's happening when we heat a material? So as we've seen before, when we heat material, we transfer thermal energy into kinetic energy, which makes the particles move faster. But because these particles are moving faster, they push each other away because they're colliding more frequently with each other. So they push each other away. So we end up with a scenario on the right hand side once we've heated our particles. So we'd expect to get a small increase in potential energy because of this increase in separation. So that's what it looks like at an atomic level when we heat something in terms of the separation. So let's use that and reflect on our equation Q equals mc delta t. So just to quickly recap what we were doing last time, what we essentially said is that if we supply a certain amount of thermal energy in a certain period of time, the kinetic energy of the atoms should increase by that same amount in the same period of time. So essentially, any thermal energy we transfer should become kinetic energy, which would give us a temperature rise because temperature and kinetic energy are directly proportional. So logically now, if we know some of the energy is transferred into potential, that means we'd get a smaller amount of kinetic energy. So that would lead to a smaller um, change in temperature. So that expression wouldn't necessarily be valid anymore. So I guess the question comes, well, why have we got this equation? Well, it's because actually the change in potential energy is pretty small when we thermally expand the material. So what we do is we neglect it in pretty much all calculations. And this is a perfectly valid thing to do. You'll get very accurate answers as long as our temperature change isn't too big. Um, so I've said around 100 Kelvin anywhere up to there is absolutely fine. To be honest, a little bit more than that is fine too, but it's just something to be aware of. This equation Q equals mc delta t works very well, but it does assume that the heat capacity of the material stays constant, which it doesn't necessarily when we get big temperature changes, and these are the reasons why. So those are some of the limitations of using Q equals mc delta t, and then maybe when it might not be appropriate to do so. Let's now have a look at how we can actually use thermal expansion to our own benefit. Did you see it? Although all materials expand when we heat them, um, the amount that they expand is different because we've got different forces between atoms. So when we supply a fixed amount of energy, different materials will expand more than others. So if we actually stick two materials together, like we can see on the left hand side, if they expand by different amounts, that 
exerts a bending force in the object and we get the two scenarios we can see on the left hand side one when it's the red has expanded more when it's heated or on the bottom when it's the red has contracted more when it's cooled so it has a bigger change in size so this can be quite useful because we can make a switch that opens or closes when essentially when the temperature gets too high or low because if we fix one side it will bend away from it or it might bend downwards if it gets too cold there so that can be quite a functional thing to have if we want a temperature sensitive circuit um, how we can build a switch using this principle let's look at how we use it to build thermometers that you may well have used so um, in terms of thinking about the properties of a material that change if we heat it if a material is expanding what that means is its volume is increasing so we've still got the same mass of material it just occupies a greater volume so what that's going to mean is its density would decrease incidentally so what we can do is we can use this as a way of measuring temperature so what we do is we put a liquid in a tube and we mark um, the volume or the height of that liquid on the thermometer and then we can heat it up and mark another point on there and it allows us to mark what volume this material occupies at certain temperatures and most of the time the liquid we use is mercury which is the only metal in a liquid state at room temperature but we could use in theory any liquid but we'll discuss why mercury is chosen now so what we do is we would put take our column of mercury and we would put it in ice that's at zero degrees so um, if we put it in ice we know it's going to be at zero degrees and we mark on the tube where essentially what volume it's at so let's do that now so essentially what we would do is we would put a marking on there and you see i do that on the left hand side then what we do is we'd put it in boiling water which we know would be at 100 degrees so what that would allow us to do is we could put another mark on our tube and we still have the original mark that we had before and then all we do with a thermometer is we divide that into 100 equal divisions which we call degrees and that would allow us to measure the temperature at any of those volumes in between those two markings that we've put on our thermometer there so that's how a thermometer is constructed this is what happens um, in a factory or when they at least early on when they were making thermometers this would be the process they would go through and this process of using these two fixed points zero degrees and 100 degrees was invented by a guy called celsius um, who i believe is swedish which is why the one of the temperature scales is called the celsius scale although interestingly um, celsius did it the other way around he made uh, the boiling point of uh, water zero and the freezing point of water um, at 100 uh, which is seems odd to us now but that's how he actually did it originally so that's how you can build a thermometer and you can go away and build your own right now should you wish um, but let's move on now and think about why mercury is used so if we use a thermometer with a large cross-sectional area what will happen is when we heat it to the same temperature we'd get a smaller change in height because the liquids would still expand by the same amount it would occupy the same final volume but the height change would be smaller in our thermometer if the liquid now occupies the same volume it did before so what we say is that makes a less sensitive thermometer because we essentially what that means is it's going to be harder to detect smaller changes in temperature that's what we mean by sensitivity but what that means is it would allow us to use the thermometer for a larger range of temperatures because we only get a small change in height um, as the temperature changes if we do the if we have a really thin thermometer if we heat it we're going to get a very large change in the height of the liquid so we'd say that makes the thermometer more sensitive because we'd easily be able to see smaller changes in temperature but if we 
increase the temperature much more, it will go over the top of the thermometer and it will stop working. So we have a smaller range of temperatures that we can use for this. So there's always a trade-off. We can make it more sensitive or we can use it on a bigger range of temperatures. So, um, question, well, we always use mercury for thermometers. So isn't that toxic? Couldn't we just use water based on what we've seen so far? Um, First of all, yes, it is correct. Mercury is toxic to humans. Uh, it's particularly damaging to our nerves in the nervous system, and you can get quite bad brain damage from it too. However, water, the, prob the problem with water is it expands too much. So if we used it in handheld thermometers, we'd only be able to use them over a very small range before the water would come flying out the end of the thermometer, which would not be very great. Or if we wanted to use a larger range of water, we'd need very big thermometers. So the reason mercury is chosen is it gives a reasonably small change in um, volume of the temperatures, which allows us to measure anywhere between I know, 0 and 100 for a typical thermometer in a nice handheld device. So that's why mercury is chosen. That finishes off this video for today, uh, looking at these four things. If you have any questions you'd like to ask at this point, please do comment and let me know. I'd be more than happy to get back to you about those. But thank you very much for taking the time to watch.